to deal with it on a case by case basis. You have to come and talk to me and uh, tell me why something is interesting or uninteresting. You have to convince me. Any other questions? Right. So let's get back to where we were. In the last lecture, we were we started looking at online learning, and in particular, we were looking at this specific model of online learning called mistake-bound learning. And the general idea in online learning is that uh, you don't make any assumptions about the distribution of the inputs and outputs. You don't care what is the probability distribution from which the x's and y's are drawn. The game is the following. You presented an example. When I say you, I mean the learning algorithm gets an example, x. It makes a prediction and then the true label of x is revealed and maybe the algorithm, if it makes a mistake, it might correct it. And then it probably throws away, it could throw away the example and then just wait for the next one to show up. That's the general uh, uh, outline of all these algorithms. And under the mistake bound model, our goal is to count the number of mistakes. All we want to do is not make too many mistakes. So we call an algorithm, we call a concept class, not an algorithm, we call a concept class learnable under the mistake bound model. If it, for any sequence of examples, it makes no more than a polynomial number of mistakes. Polynomial in what? In the size of the input. It's just a definition. Uh, size of the function size or input? Uh, the size of the input. The dimensionality, number of features, for example. Okay? Can we relate the number of errors to the number of dimensions when we are looking only at one example at a time? Our goal, we are not, we are, even though we are only looking at one example at a time, we want in the long run the number of mistakes to be bounded. And that is a property of the concept class, if you want. The size of the concept class, um, the number of functions, which is inherently a function of the number of the dimensionality. Any questions about this general style of analyzing learning algorithms or concept classes? So as a side effect, if you are able to say that a concept class, class is learnable under a mistake model, mistake bound model with a particular algorithm, you can have a learning algorithm. But in general, this is just an existential statement. If there exists any learning algorithm. But that's an exponential. So What's an exponential? Concept class is basically it's exponentially proportional to the number of dimensions. Right, so if, we, if you remember the halving algorithm makes a log of the size of the concept class. Yeah. So that's, for example, one of those uh, cases where it works. So I just wanted to clarify a few things about the mistake power model. All they're doing is counting mistakes. If you think about it, we really don't care whether we learn the function or not, the hidden function. We don't really care. All we want to do is not make too many mistakes. In So in the worst case, the we have no control over the sequence in which examples are presented to us. In the worst case, the same example could keep coming back to us again and again. And it's okay, because we are not going to make any more mistakes. I just want you to keep that in mind. It's a bit of a perverse setup <coughs> because you are not really learning anything. If I keep saying the same thing again and again, you have not learned anything <coughs> and it's okay. You have not made any mistakes. This is a demonstration of wire And test. that's just, yes. So, uh, as we are explaining, so let's say we have, uh, we have taken an hypothesis and we have fed a function, then we are taking a case of those functions. At the end, we are, no one is correct. So, we are left with zero functions. No right. One right. So, then we have to change the hypothesis, right? Yes. But we have seen all those examples and we don't have any those examples in our hands. What do we do? Well, then your hypothesis space is wrong and you start again. 
But we don't have those examples. They just said these examples just come and for a short of time and. After using them, we just demonstration of wire cuts. Sure. Uh, let's for now play the game of game that we know what the hypothesis class is. Uh, the setup that you just mentioned is the one where the we know the we don't know the concept class, and you have to assume what the hypothesis class is. We have to make an assumption, and we just hope that it's correct. Uh, that is a slightly more difficult situation to analyze. For now, let's play the game that we know that we know that what the hypothesis class is. In fact, in the previous exam, in the previous uh, lecture, the hypothesis classes we saw were the same as the concept class. Yeah. Let's for now live in that regime. When it gets to more complex setup, so things get the analysis becomes slightly more involved, and things become even less possible or more difficult. We saw the halving algorithm, and it's a simple algorithm that works for finite is a uh, concepts uh, or target or hypothesis classes, and it works in the following way. In general, we store a set of hypotheses that are consistent with all our examples that we have seen so far. That's the general setup. When you get a new example. What do you need to do in an online algorithm? First, make a prediction. Prediction in this case is defined in the following way: we have a set of functions. If a, we predict the label of a majority of them, this is a demonstration of so we have made a predi prediction. And then we can check if there's an error. We just drop everything that disagrees. What that means is, if a majority of the data, a majority of the functions disagrees with this new example point, then we and we we are going to drop all of them, and cut down the size of the concept, the search space by half. So every mistake will cut down the search space by half. This is like binary search. So we will eventually end up with a log uh, uh, with a log size of concept class uh, mistake bound. Okay, this is a theoretical concept. Convenient, but you can't really implement it uh, because this requires you to enumerate that every enumerate the hypothesis class, which in all but the most trivial cases is really hard. But it still pr uh, provides a useful uh, construct to think about. Demonstration of wire cast. Uh, but it uh, in the case of Boolean functions, it gives good bounds, lower bounds. You cannot do better than that in general it's not optimal because the halving algorithm removes a majority of the functions that disagree with this example that's all it does what we care about is to remove all those functions or to keep only those functions that will guarantee us a good mistake bound and these two need not be the same. These two goals need not be the same. So in general, having need not be optimal. It can, <coughs> but it's, a, it's just a good existence proof. There can be a mistake bound out. Now, instead of eliminating functions that disagree with our data, maybe we can downweight parts of them. Or we can, of instead of completely eliminating them, we can just lower their importance in our final prediction. This style of thinking leads to additive or multiplicative update algorithms. And that brings us back to linear classifiers. So any questions about anything that we did in the last uh, class? This is a demonstration of wire cast. So one, the question in the homework which talks about these circles, question two, basically asks you to invent a learning algorithm for that concept class and for grad students, and I encourage everyone to try it out, you basically instantiate this halving algorithm for that particular concept class. So you get to work through that, uh, the details of this. And it will help you figure out 
and maybe there will be questions once you see that. This is a demonstration of why. So where are these? We've seen online algorithms. You've seen these cute little toy algorithms that uh, probably don't really apply in real life data. So let's talk about an algorithm that is one of the older supervised learning algorithms out there, um, and is probably one of the most popular and one of the easiest to implement algorithms. This is the perceptron algorithm, and to get to it, let's just uh, refresh our memories about linear classifiers. Of Wirecast. The setup is the following: inputs are vectors in n dimensions, and outputs are just true or false, minus one, or plus one, or zero or one. Uh, for at least this section of the class, I'll be using minus one to indicate false. Uh, because it just makes the math work out a little bit easier. And the function that you use to predict is parameterized by a weight vector, and I'll always refer to it as w. w is an n-dimensional vector, and it, it lets you make a prediction by given an input, x. You take the dot product of the w and the x, add a bias term, that's the score for this input. And if this score is positive, you say plus one. If the score is negative, you say minus one. That is, you just predict the sign of that score. <coughs> that's a linear threshold. Right? And B is called the bias term. And sometime back, maybe a couple of lectures back, I pointed out that the bias term can basically be folded into W by having a constant feature that's always one. And you still do a dot product. Uh, so I'll be switching between these two notations just to confuse you and <laughs> make sure that you're awake. <laughs> the idea is that I want you to remember that for binary classification, a bias term is very important. Even if I don't have it in my slide, you should always have a bias term. Because otherwise, you're basically only considering functions that go through the origin, lines that go through the origin. And uh, sometimes you see this kind of a diagram. Uh, it's just a diagram. It doesn't mean much. Uh, the idea is that you get some input, and you have some weights. You take the dot product. You sum them up. Pass it through a threshold unit. And that's your prediction. Is a demonstration. And the reason I drew this diagram here is mostly to point out the connection between this sort of stuff and neural networks. Uh, the perceptron algorithm started off as an algorithm for learning a neural network, a simple neuron. It was supposed to be a model of a neuron, an idealized model of a neuron. But uh, we know better than that. We, we understand the geometry of the linear classifier. Basically, you have given points in n-dimensional space, and the linear threshold unit can be represented by a hyperplane that slices the space and proclaims one side to be the positive, the other side is the negative, and that's all there is. So if you see a single layer neural network, and you see these weird diagrams, and you feel more comfortable with geometry, all you're doing is slicing n-dimensional space. You're cutting the space, and the hyperplane that cuts it is the classifier, is what you want to learn. The other thing that I want you to notice here, and this is important at least for today's lecture, and in fact coming up, is this hyperplane is entirely defined by a vector, w, which is perpendicular to the plane. In this case, it's defined by w and a b, but if I do that trick of folding the b into the uh, weight vector, it's entirely defined by W, and the geometry of it is it's a vector that's perpendicular to the hyperplane. A demonstration of wire cast. <coughs> okay? So, before we get to the perceptron algorithm, any questions about any of this? The next time I pause for questions, I'm not going to ask you if you have questions. I'm going to start picking people. <laughs> so 
Let's start uh, with the perceptron arc. This, demonstration of wire uh, this came up in a paper in 1958. Frank Rosenblatt uh, proposed this uh, algorithm. And it, I just found this paper last week and I thought it was cool. But really, the, even though it was introduced from the perspective of uh, some sort of neural network thing, the goal, as we know very well now, is to find a separating hyperplane. And the cool thing about the perceptron algorithm, and we'll actually see a formal proof of this, is that the perceptron algorithm, if your data is separable, is linearly separable, your algorithm will find the hyperplane, the separating hyperplane, after making only a finite number of mistakes. That's the neat thing about the algorithm. And it's an online algorithm. What that means is, you know, you get one example, we process it and throw it away, make an update on uh, it error. Or at least the simplest version of this algorithm is an online algorithm. The, there are robust w variants of this that we actually end up implementing in practice. And those are not online. And I think the homework actually are, walks you through this process of implementing the perceptron algorithm. And we will see some variants of this uh, at the end of Sruit's lecture. So, enough uh, introduction, let's talk about the algorithm itself. This is the entire algorithm here. You're given a sequence of examples, x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on. x1, and the xi's are real value vectors, the yi's are pluses or minuses. So you start off the process by initializing your weight vector, you could initialize it to zero, or if you feel particularly uh, ambitious or adventurous, you could pick a random vector. And when you're given a new trick, well, and this is the <coughs> online algorithm, so you, all you need to do to define the, the entire algorithm is to say what happens, two things, how is the prediction made, and the second one, what's an update, if there's an error. How is the prediction made? Well, this is a linear th uh, threshold unit. So use the linear threshold unit to make a prediction. Take the dot product of the input and the weight vector and take the sign of it. That's all that is. If there's a mistake, the perceptron algorithm says you update your weight vector wt at the teeth time step or at the teeth this mistake here demonstration of wire cast. by adding y times x and scale it with some r. r is a learning rate, it's a constant. So every time you make a mistake, you update your weight vector by adding the product of the input and the output. Now, this may seem a little weird, but I'll talk about the geometric interpretation of this. This has a nice uh, interpretation. And let it's an online algorithm. In theory, we don't really care about uh, the final weight vector. Uh, in theory, we can let this algorithm run till infinity, and every time a new example comes in, it makes a prediction or and possibly an update. But uh, because we live in, we don't have infinite time, we assume that we, after m examples, we say that learning is done, and you return the final weight vector. Yes. Uh, should we also prove that our algorithm convert our, our final uh, weight vector converts? For example, if we get a new sample, it doesn't move and then just... We will, uh, we will prove that. Was there another question? You heard it? Any? Yes. Is the SGN, is that just the sign function? Yes, SGN is the sign. It's from Latin signal. I don't know why. I could have added an I there, and it would have been easier. But Yes. So when you say that W is zero, we initialize to zero? Yeah. So when we yes, multiply W here, transpose by x i. So the first time you, yeah. at the first example, if the first example is positive, you're okay. Right? Because that's not, uh, the score for the first example is zero, the sign of zero is mm -hmm. by convention plus. So you're okay, you've not made a mistake. If the first example is negative, actually that's an interesting question. What happens if the first example is negative? What, let's say R is 1. 
First example is negative. Y times x is minus x. And w0 is 0. So w1 will become minus x. Now, we'll talk about why this is interesting, but intuitively, what this means is the next time, suppose the same example comes in, x comes in, x transpose minus x is negative. So if you are getting only one example and it's always negative, in one update you're finished, to, you basically you're done. You're never going to make mistakes on that example again. But it's possible that the next, the second example will not be the same and it could reverse the sign. Um, in practice, the proof, in, in, in practice, nothing stops it from happening. Uh, if your data is linearly separable, that will not happen. T is, here I'm, I'm using T as an, a counter for the number of times you're updating W. So every time you start off WT well, with T equals zero, and every time you make a mistake, you increment The reason I use this notation is because in the proof later on, I'll be using T to represent the number of mistakes. And that's the mistake bound We'll be putting a bound on the number of um, how much t can grow from this algorithm. Yes. R is common for all these situations. Um, for the simplest version, yes. It's common for all the features and for all the examples. There are variants that uh, assign uh, different costs for each feature. But then, how do you? If you are, if you have a million-dimensional space, then you have to specify a million-dimensional vector up front. Very often, not worth it. But we are already. <laughs> you can fight it out. <laughs> so why we should have the duplicative examples in our training in our training sequence? Is it is possible that x one comes twice? It, Remember that this is the, in the simplest case, it's, a, it's an online algorithm. We have no control over the sequence. All we get is one n-dimensional vector. We have no guarantee about whether we've seen it before or not. So in the worst case, you could be getting the same example again and again. In fact, is it, is it the really the worst case? You get the same example again and again, basically you've solved the problem. But there are, there's nothing that prevents that from happening. And it's often uh, an interesting edge case to study, to see what happens. Because nothing prevents it ha from happening. So let's see what happens. Yeah, so we are already having million dimension or million dimensional vector, which is W, right? Sure. So means we can have R also. Yeah, but W is actually being learned. R is a constant. R is an input to the program. Yeah, but R may be very useful when we have some domain knowledge, right? About the features, how they are related. Sure. If you know about if you if you are willing to manually write down something, sure. But a personal philosophy of mine is uh, I'm prone to laziness when it comes to these things. So I would rather have the program do the dirty work. This has no weight on the So if X, say you said X is one, if that happens a couple hundred times and then it switches signs to minus one, it really doesn't care how many inputs it, like it's not weighted based on how many times that inputs it. That occurs. label shows up. Because it'll just show up as yes. predict, predict, or predicted. Correctly. Hold on to that thought. Uh, <laughs> this style of learning is called discriminative learning. You really don't care about the distribution of the data or anything. Um, we only care about making the prediction, right? This is a demonstration of why. And we will get to a discussion of that quite a bit later. Yes. Reading this uh, exchange sign, how is that so linearly separable? It's not. He's talking about uh, a sequence of. Uh, he, he, I think if I understand your question right, this algorithm doesn't care about the number of pluses and minuses that your algorithm. Yeah. It sees. So. If you're not talking about the same example getting alternating signs. Yeah, if there were noise or something. Yeah, we pretend that everything is linearly separable. Possible.
demonstration. Okay, let's move on because uh, I think <coughs> there are some very good questions and a lot of you are foreshadowing the rest of this lecture. Might as well get on with it. <laughs> so, just as a reminder, in all cases, both within the algorithm and eventually after learning is done, prediction is the sign of W transpose X. There's always a bias term. And I have multiple remind. I have this reminder pasted across multiple slides just to drive on the point. And the other thing is, uh, we'll represent false as minus one. That's because the sine function is if false is zero, then this disappears. So that's uh, rather inconvenient. So true is one, and false is minus one. And let's. Pick, pick this uh, algorithm apart a bit. When there's a mistake on a positive example, what you do is you add the input to the weight factor, possibly scale. When there's a mistake on a negative example, <coughs> you subtract the input from the weight factor. Right? So basically, what this means is your weight vector, you're hoping, will look like the positive example. The weight vector points towards the general space that is positive. And if you think about the geometry of what this means, uh, that's a reasonable thing to do. This is a R is a learning rate, typically a small number less than or equal to 1. It's an input to the program, at least for now. And it's a mistake driven algorithm, uh, an online algorithm, because you only change your parameters when there's a mistake. This is the simplest version. We will look at uh, more robust variants at the end of this uh, class. And this is just uh, mathematical convenience. Sometimes you'll see mistakes being written as y w transpose x is negative. Because if w transpose x is positive and y is negative, the product is negative. And vice versa. So if the product is negative, then you know you made a mistake. So I can just merge these two steps, the if in, into this uh, check, and just check for y times w transpose x is negative. And that's a convenient uh, way of writing it, because we will end up using that notation this later on. This is a demonstration of wire cast. So, yes. So when we add that <coughs> vector to the w, it means that we are actually rotating the hyperplane. Yes, we are rotating the hyperplane. Counterclockwise. Yep. Well, I don't know what's counterclockwise, but yes. So let's look at the intuition behind this update. Oh, just can you go back? Well, I just want to say there might be some technical difficulty. It's the last to check. Why? So what if x i dot y t is zero? Y t is a scalar. Of y okay. y no, x dot w is zero. That's okay. This, then you, you can't see whether it's a mistake or not because times plus one or minus one is zero. If x times if w if the score is positive, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. If the this the, on the bright side, the, it will be positive. It will be zero only once. Because you are going to update it, so uh, that's a very that's an easy check. Sure. Okay. Now let's look at the intuition behind this update. In particular, for a positive uh, uh, example, so we are sitting on a weight vector W T. We've made a mistake. What that means is W T transpose X is negative, and Y is plus one. So you correct your weights. Wt plus 1 is, for now, let's say r is 1. Wt plus 1 is wt plus x. What does this do to the score assigned to this input x? To see that, all you have to do is take the dot product. So let's take the dot product of the new weight vector, that's wt plus 1 transpose x. And that is really the previous score plus x transpose x, which is greater than the previous score. So what we have done is, if there's a mistake on a positive example, which means if we have made a mistake in the case where we know that our score, we want our score to be positive, 
this update will make the score slightly more positive. It may not make it greater than zero, it will push it towards zero or further. This is the algebraic intuition behind this update. <coughs> okay? And you can, in fact, I encourage you to work out the equivalent thing for negative examples. It's rather easy. It's almost entirely the same. This is a demonstration of wire cast. Now, that's the algebraic version. Let's look at the geometry of that. Remember that a weight vector is entirely defined, uh, a hyperplane is entirely defined by a weight vector. And let's say we make a mistake on a positive weight vector. So we have a <coughs> W, which points in that direction, which means the hyperplane is the plane that's perpendicular to it. So it's this line here. And say we get an example x, which is this point. Every point is also a vector, so it's this black vector. The dot product is negative. Intuitively, what this means is the point and the direction in which the weight vector are pointing towards are in opposite directions, or on opposite sides of the hyperplane. So this is a mistake. So what's the update? Update is w is w plus x, because y is plus 1. w plus x is let's apply the parallelogram law for vector addition. Of wire this test. is x and this should not be a shock to any one of you. Okay? And that gives us a new weight vector and I have cleverly chosen points and examples and weight vector uh, hyperplane such that the new one perfectly classifies the point. So what we have done is the update rotates the hyperplane, as you mentioned before. And it rotates the hyperplane so that after the update, hopefully the wave vector points towards the positive example. <coughs> <coughs> Questions about the geometry of this? What if X has a very small magnitude with respect to You will not make much of an update. You probably will not get that example right. Um, and there's nothing, like I said, there's nothing that says that this one update will fix it, fix everything. <laughs> and the other trick question is, here I assume R is 1. What if I tune R on a per example basis so that you get this example right? So you let, this is, this should have been R times Yx, right? I can make R times Yx really, really long. And that, that particular variant of perceptron is called the aggressive perceptron. And it's, uh, I walk through the steps of the aggressive perceptron in the homework, in fact. There were two questions. Go ahead. Um, can you talk about how the, is is the, the geometry is biased when it gets updated? Right, so let's see. Effectively, it still rotates the hyperplane. It may move the bias up or down. Um, I really don't like to think of the bias as a separate uh, thing simply because the bias, if you are in two-dimensional space and you add a bias, it's mm -hmm. like a hyperplane in three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So in three dimensions, it moves, the, it rotates the plane. There was a question at the end? No. Okay. Yes. Do we get the same result if we sum up all the positive examples and sum up all the negative examples and then sub yes and then I mean subtract or sum these two vectors? Um, almost right. You get the same examples if, let's say, you do the following in hindsight. You get the same weight vector if you do the following in hindsight. You sum up all the positive examples on which you made a mistake and all the negative examples on which you made a mistake and subtract. No, no. Why, why those ones that you make a Because you only update when you make a mistake. If I want the exact same weight vector. Okay, the exact, but still intuitively it seems that it is rotating, it is rotating the weight vector toward positive examples. And I right, right, so that's a different algorithm. What you're, what you're talking about is a, uh, it's a different way of finding a linear threshold. You're, 
and that may the, and it it is also uh, it can also work. You don't need to do that. I mean, all you need to get this uh, the person the mistake bound guarantee is to sum up only those examples on which you made an error. But you could sum up all the examples. There is no simple algorithm. There is no. Uh, we won't be looking at any of those algorithms in the class. People have tried it, but uh, that's we won't be looking at specifically those things in this class. <coughs> Right, so, uh, I, so we also need to translate this hyperplane, it's not just the rotation, right? Because we have the bias. Right, so that was the similar thing. I mean, uh, if you go into n plus 1 dimensions, it's still a rotation because uh, the bias term becomes one more weight. And it corresponds to translation. It does correspond to a translation. In fact, that's the answer to the question. If you actually explicitly make this bias, it will both rotate and translate. Just to drive home this point, let's look at another. Uh, yes. I, I just wondering, like after we updated the weight, then is that possible? The accuracy for the estimation will be getting worse, or it must be getting better. Accuracy on what? On the like the for all the training sets. If you run this on the training set enough number of times, and your data is linearly separable, your accuracy will be hundred percent because it will find a separate Because, but then it's on the training set. Yes? So why is it enough number of times? Is it in the situation of wire You need to make enough number of mistakes. If the mistake bound says uh, the algorithm should make a thousand mistakes, and you made a thousand mistakes, you're done. Let's look at uh, what happens when this algorithm, uh, when you see a negative example, uh, not, nothing too surprising. So let's say you, this is your current weight vector, you see an example, and this example is marked as a negative one. And according to this weight vector, the weight vector is pointing in the same direction as this example, so it's positive, so you have to make an update, and you do the same thing again. It's, now this time it is, uh, W old minus x, <coughs> an update, and you basically rotate the hyperplane. So every update rotates the hyperplane slightly so that the score of that example becomes slightly more in the right, uh, with the right sign. So any questions about the geometry of the Algorithm. And this is by far, this is the simplest version of the algorithm that we've seen so far. There are many, 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 many variants of this. And you can do tricks involving the plane itself, the features, the, the space, the update rule, the learning rate. All of them do the update in terms of summation? Yes, these are, this is an additive uh, update. By definition, this algorithm is an additive. Uh, update algorithm. Probably in the next lecture we'll be looking at something called the multiplicative update algorithm, which surprisingly, not surprisingly, does the update using multiplication. So, what can it learn? So, the perceptron algorithm, it's just an algorithm for learning a linear classifier, a linear threshold. And only thing it can learn, only thing it can represent after learning are functions that are linearly separable. We looked at examples of functions that are linearly separable. So uh, disjunctions, conjunctions, m of n and such things. In particular, it cannot represent a parity function. So if your data looks like a parity function, you give it to Poseidon, you can't complain that it didn't learn. 
Uh, and it took about 10 years or something from when the paper, first perceptron paper came out of until this observation was made. Uh, this was an influential book by Minsky and Papert, and it was so influential that after that people, I think research in neural networks and this style of learning algorithms stopped for almost a decade. Because they pointed out this cannot learn everything, but we know that. If it cannot, if a function cannot represent something, it cannot cannot learn it. But uh, it took some for time for this understanding to show up. So just to summarize this section of the class, of the lecture, what you need to know is the following. You need to understand the perceptron argument. If I wake you up in the middle of the night and ask you to tell me the perceptron update, you should be able to say it. Because <laughs> it's that easy. You should understand the geometry of the perceptron update. And <laughs> Remember that the perceptron learning algorithm only talks about, only can learn linearly separable functions. Which is not a really big problem because we saw that many functions can be made linearly separable by adding conjunctions, by blowing up the feature space, and sometimes a little bit of noise is okay. Any questions about the algorithm itself? Yes. So if we have a very large, um, like a large amount of data, like a million by a million or something, um, but it turns out that the data is maybe sort of sparse, can you run yes. the perceptron? It's like sparse in what? what? Can you define what exactly sparse means? Right. So what I mean is that even though the space you're in is multi, whatever, million dimensional, the data is separated in, you, you don't need the million dimensions to separate the data. Right. Can you... Is it still linearly separable in the million dimensional space? Well, if it, <coughs> if it is linearly separable in the highest space, and, and you, have, you have vectors, they have a million, whatever, sure. but it's also linear, linearly separable in a lower space, can you just run it iteratively to see at which point it won't play? Not, uh, in, a, not in a simple way. Okay. But I'll ask the question that you did not ask, but I think you were getting mm -hmm. What if your data lies in a million dimensional space, your each example lies in a million dimensional space, but you don't know, or you know that no more than a small number of them are relevant. Meaning most of the features are always zero, or not most of the features, most of the true weight vector is zero. This is a demonstration of wirecast. Is perceptron the best algorithm to run in that particular case? The answer is no. In that case, the best algorithm to use is a multiplicative update algorithm. Mm -hmm. The additive algorithm, uh, perceptron for example, its mistake bound is a function of the dimensionality of the space, mm -hmm. not of the underlying dimensionality. Mm -hmm. So you don't take any advantage of those kinds of things. Was there a question? Somewhere here? No. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's now uh, talk about analyzing this algorithm. Let's talk about the perceptron bound. But before getting into the details of it, I want to just give you uh, the general flavor of the kind of results that we'll be proving. There's something called the convergence here, which simply says, if there is a set of weights that separates the data, then the perceptron algorithm will find it. And we look at a proof of that. It won't find it. It will find another vector, possibly another vector that also separates the data. Of wire cast. The cycling theorem, which is a negative result, says if your data is not linearly separable, then the learning algorithm will basically thrash. It will cycle through a set of weight vectors. Because it will make a mistake, it will correct it, and then it will go to the next one. The next one, which was originally correct, will uh, would have been reversed, and then basically it keeps doing this thing. It keeps going back and forth between a different set of a set of weight vectors. This is a demonstration to of wire actually test. talk about the convergence theorem, I need to introduce this idea called a margin. And a margin is a very important concept in the study of linear classifiers. And in fact, when we come to support vector machines, we'll be spending a lot of time talking about margins. <coughs> the general idea is about So let's say you have a collection of points, positive and negative, and a weight vector and hyperplane. 
the margin of this hyperplane is the distance of the plane from the closest point to it. Doesn't matter what the label is. Okay? So in this picture, this distance here is the margin of that line. That's just the margin of this plane. I can also ask what's the margin of the data? The margin of the data is the largest possible margin. You try out every possible weight vector and you find the maximum possible margin and that's the margin of the data. This is a demonstration of the data set. So I can define a margin for a hyperplane and basically what this means is W transpose X, assuming if this weight vector is a unit vector, then W transpose X, absolute value of that is always more than the margin. Right? Because the distance of a line from a plane, remember homework zero, the distance of a line from a plane is, uh, what did I say, distance of a point from a plane, Demonstration of wire cast. that is, uh, the, if the plane is denoted, defined by w is w dot x divided by the norm of x. So if you have a unit vector, then w dot x, the absolute value of that is the distance. And the smallest value of that is the margin. And the largest value of the margin is the margin of the data. It takes way more words to say this than to actually draw it. Yes? So is that margin the same from between the positives and the negatives? In, yes. Yes. So it's actually going, it's going through the middle. Because, middle because if it were not the same, then one of them will be bigger, and that would be, and the other, the other one would be the margin. So in some sense, the margin uh, can be fo found in a loose uh, sense of the word "found" by trying to fit all weight vectors and jiggling them around so that the distance between the closest negative and the positive points to the plane is equal. Right? This is a demonstration and this is a very important concept and it's, it's rather important that you understand it intuitively. Questions about the margin? Okay, so with this idea of margin, let's talk about the mistake bound here. This is uh, attributed to Novikov from 1962. And I'm going to step through the theorem, talk about it, and then sort of parse the math and give you a layperson version of it before actually getting to the proof. The setup is the following. The assumption is you're given a sequence of examples, x1, x2, and so on, with labels y1, y2. And all examples are n-dimensional vectors. The labels are pluses and minus ones. And you assume that all examples are contained, the x, i is their vectors, right? All of them are contained in a ball of size r. This is a demonstration so that's the uh, x, i, the norm of x, i is less than or equal to r. That's one assumption. Second assumption is, suppose there is a weight vector, and just to make life a little easier, let's say that there is a unit vector u, again n-dimensional, whose norm is 1, Let's say there's a unit vector u and a gamma, which is positive, such that u separates the data with a margin w, with a margin gamma. What this means simply is that this data is linearly separable. So basically, we are assuming that the data is linearly separable. Then the theorem says the Poisson Cronin algorithm will make no more than r square or gamma square mistakes on this data set. It doesn't matter what the sequence of the examples is. It does not care about the number of examples. This is important. Notice that this bound does not depend on the size of the training set. The size of the training set. Of wire cast. You will make no more than R square over gamma square mistakes. So let's just walk through this whole thing again. First of all, this constraint that uh, all the points are contained in a size in the ball of size r is not really a constraint. It's just take the farthest point from the origin and call it the distance from the origin to that r. That's the definition of r. So r is really a function of your data set. This is 
a demonstration well, of wire cast. Possibly. It's actually a function of the, uh, that of the underlying space. The second thing is this assumption. I just want to repeat it. I mentioned it, but I want to repeat it. This assumption that y times u transpose x is greater than gamma <coughs> simply says that the data is linearly separable. Because if it were linearly separable, then you can always find a gamma. Because there is a gap between the positives and negatives, and you try to find a margin there. And this gamma is really a parameter that defines how separable the data is. In some sense, it indicates how difficult this problem is, intuitively. If the margin is really, really large, it will be easy to find a weight vector. If the margin is really small, it would be harder to find one, which is why the gamma is in the denominator. If gamma is large, you will make fewer mistakes, because the problem is easier. If gamma is small, the problem is harder, so you might make more mistakes. And the other point I want to mention is this restriction of it being the weight vector u of the vector u being a unit vector is not really a restriction. If it were not u, it just changes the mistake bound. Uh, it scales the mistake bound by the norm of uh, norm square, square norm of uh, u. And you can see that by just basically dividing this whole thing by uh, u on both sides, this norm of u, and you get a new margin and plug that in. So, effectively, what this theorem says is the following. Suppose you have a binary classification problem in n dimensions. If the data is linearly separable, then the positron algorithm will find a separating hyperplane in a finite time. In a finite, sorry, it's not a finite time. It'll it's got nothing to do with time. The positron algorithm will find uh, a separating hyperplane after making only a finite number of mistakes because we are in the mistake bound now. Any questions about this theorem before we get into the proof? Yes. So the opposite is also true. If I don't find, if I can't find uh, the uh, solution within that number of mistakes, then that problem is not really separable. If I fail to find within that limit. I would say Assuming yes. My implementation is correct. I would say yes, but here's the thing I, would, I want you to think about. Let's say I give you a data set. What's its margin? How will you find its margin? For to find its margin, you need to find the weight vector. So the margin is really just a theoretical construct. Without your weight vector, you can't find a margin. And if you had the weight vector, you won't be running the algorithm. So, this only gives you a bound on the number of mistakes, but it does not tell you how to find the bound, how to find it practically. The theorem only says you, it will make a finite number of mistakes. That's a good question. You can't find the margin easily. If you could, then you solve the problem. And that's another way of learning, in fact, to find the minimum margin, or the maximizing the maximum margin. Other questions about this theorem? Yes. Do you, could you explain again the statement that it's the yi times u transpose xi to be greater than the margin? So, what that means is, suppose, you, what it says is the following. u transpose x, let's say there is a vector u, and u transpose x is it is the score that it assigns to an example x. Now, if u were the subtrue weight vector, then u transpose x and yi will have the same sign. Mm -hmm. right? The margin condition says, not only will it have the same sign, but there's actually a gap between that and 0. right? And that gap is the margin. And it just says there exists some positive gap. So y times the score being positive is a check for whether you got the prediction right. But it's also the 
absolute value of the distance because u is a unit vector. Mm -hmm. And all you're saying is that the unit, the distance is greater than gamma. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, so let's look at the proof. Um, to set up the proof, I just want to remind you that the algorithm is the one on top. Uh, you receive an example and you make an update by adding, if there's an error, you make an update by adding y times x. For sake of the proof, we'll always assume that the learning rate is 1. If it is not 1, you can always, you can think of the learning rate as a way of scaling every example, basically. And we can fold it into the x's. So we're not going to let the learning, learning rate affect us for the proof. And, uh, at least to make the proof easy, it's convenient to say that the initial weight vector is all zeros. And the two conditions that theorem gave us where all examples are contained in a ball of size r, that is for any xi, the norm of xi is less than r. And the other one is there is some u such that this condition holds. That is gamma is less than yi u transpose xi for all i. So we'll step through this proof in three stages. Uh, and if you look it up in any textbook or something, it's usually presented as a couple of lemmas or claims before actually getting to the final result. The first claim is after t mistakes, the dot product of the true weight vector u and the t uh, weight vector wt is greater than t gamma. It's just a claim. So let's prove that first. So to do that, let's look at the dot product of u times wt plus 1. By definition of the update, u times wt plus 1, u dot wt plus 1 is u dot wt plus y times u transpose x. Right? But you know that y times u transpose x is more than gamma. Because that's the assumption we make. We assume that the data is linearly separable. <coughs> so what this means is once you make an update, the dot product increases by at least gamma. And after you do, and you know that u times w naught is 0 because w, the weight vector starts off at 0 at the beginning. So it's rather simple with induction to show that this term u times u transpose wt will be more than t gamma. You keep doing this, keep repeating this multiple times, all the way down to zero. What this says is this doesn't let's just keep this. Remember this. Okay? And this is rather simple algebra. It should not be shocking. The second uh, lemma is the following. After t mistakes, the norm of the weight vector, w <coughs> will be less than t r squared. <coughs> Similar sort of a proof, really. You just look at wt plus 1. The norm of that norm square is just apply the update. Look at the definition of this is basically the definition of a square. And let's look at these three terms. We know that the last term is less than or equal to r because we know that every point, every xi is within a actually it's less than or equal to r square. We know that every point is contained in a ball of size r. You know that this term, we've made a mistake. This is a demonstration so of y times, the only reason we updated is because we've made a mistake. To get from wt to wt plus 1, if there was no mistake, we wouldn't have made this change. What that means is y times w transpose x is negative. So, That means this term on the right is greater than wt squared plus r squared. Because 
This guy is less than zero. We can get rid of that. This guy is less than R squared. Again, the same sort of induction will tell us that uh, the norm of W T squared is less than T R squared. Questions? Yes. Uh, that may be a typo. It's less than equal to. Um, because you are removing a negative term. Yeah. Yes, it's a type. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Okay, so let's just see what we have right here. And basically, the proof is almost done. The first step of the proof, sure that after t mistakes, u transpose wt is greater than t gamma. The second claim is that after t mistakes, the norm of wt square is less than t r square. And the final step of the proof is just to chain these together with some rather easy <coughs> algebra. The second one tells us that r root t is greater than the norm of wt. Now the, piece, the one piece of information that we haven't used yet from the theorem is that u is a unit vector. So let's use that now. Let's, the norm of wt, because u is a unit vector, is going to be greater than u transpose wt. Why is that? There are many ways of proving this. Uh, here's a simple one. u transpose wt is norm of u times norm of w times cos cosine of the distance between, of the angle between them. Norm of w, u is 0, or is 1, so this disappears. We know that cosine is less than 1. And so the u transpose w is less than the norm of w. But we know something about u transpose w. It's greater than t gamma, because that's from the first claim. This is a demonstration so of wire cast. In doing that, if you look at the first and the last terms, we've gotten rid of all the w's and the u's, and we have an expression that is only relating the number of mistakes to R and gamma. So the number of mistakes is less than T R square over gamma square, and this gives us the mistake bound. Questions about this proof? <coughs> this is a demonstration of wire cast. And if I've gone too fast through this or too slow, just let me know. Yes? So if we change the value of little r, would it affect how it's fast it would learn? Of wire cast. If you change the value of little r, it does affect the, the how fast it will actually learn. Yes, you are right. So this is only for if little r is exactly equal to 1. If r is not equal to 1, let's see where the, the changes that would be need to, that you need to make. You can think of r as a term that scales the x's, right? So let's multiply the r into the x. But where does that show up? It shows up this in the big r, of wire right? Test. Effectively, we know that the norm of x, the distance from x to the origin for all x is less than r. But because we have scaled it, it's less than r times r. So what that means is there will be a little r square term here. So if the r gets very small, the number of mistakes you make might get small. But if in practice what happens is if r is really large, you will bounce around too much, you will overcorrect. So, and finding r is a bit of a black art. Okay, let me just uh, get to the, show you the theorem again. Now that we've seen the proof, the theorem might be easier to parse. I'm going to walk through it again. Uh, if you have examples x1, y, xi, yi, 
with all the points, all the xi's being within a ball of size r. And if there is a unit weight vector, unit vector u that separates the data with the margin gamma, then the perceptron algorithm will make no more than r square over gamma square mistakes. That's basically the statement of the theorem. Let's, uh, let's analyze this. In fact, Instead of me analyzing it, I'm going to have you do it uh, at the exercises just to see if you can make of wire <coughs> test your own understanding of this. First of all, R is a property. I'm going to claim that R is a property not of the data, but of the underlying of the dimensionality of n. I, if I say that this is a mistake bound algorithm, remember the definition of a mistake. Uh, a concept is learnable in a mistake bound model if it makes no more than a polynomial number of mistakes and the polynomial is in the dimensionality. Here the polynomial is in R. But how do we get from R to N? And in particular, for, you can show for Boolean functions. If your, all your points are bit vectors, n-dimensional bit vectors, you can show that R square is N. Why? Because the worst case is the point with all ones. The farthest point from the origin is the point with all ones. What's the point with all ones? N, you have n ones. What's the distance of that from the origin? Root n. So r square is n in the Boolean space. So if you are, then, then the number of mistakes is O of n, basically. Is bounded is O of n. Which is a polynomial in n, so we have a mistake bound algorithm for Boolean functions. While R is a property of the space, gamma is a property of the data. It tells us how hard, how difficult this particular classification problem is. And it's this property that's rather hard to compute. So if you had gamma, then you solve the problem. So just to um, see if you've understood this, you can work this out uh, on your own time. How many mistakes will the perceptron algorithm make on these junctions for with in n dimensional spaces? All you need to do is calculate the value of r and gamma, and I've already told you what r is because it's a Boolean function. So for a disjunction, and if you want to make it simpler, make think of monotone disjunctions. There are no negations involved. For monotone disjunctions, <coughs> what's the margin? And to actually work this out, I would say start off with the two-dimensional example. You can actually draw the hyperplane, or the line in that case, and figure out what the margin is. This will force you to think about margins, which is good. Now the question is, how many mistakes will it make in the case of k disjunctions? And this is actually an interesting question. Of wire cast. What's a k disjunction? A k disjunction is you have an n-dimensional bit vector, but only k of them are relevant. Does the number of relevant features, what does that mean? You have a million features, but the true function is a disjunction of only three of them, let's say. But you don't know which three. Perceptron algorithm, and I'm going to give you the answer to this. The perceptron algorithm, remember the mistake bound, is not a function of k. It's only a function of n. So that's a bit of an unpleasant fact about this thing. It doesn't matter if you, in, in what's called the infinite attribute space, when the number of features is infinite, you will make an infinite mistakes. So that's not a great setup, but uh, we will look at an algorithm which has a k-dependency later on in the next class. And in fact, fine. This is interesting. Work out a sequence of examples that will force the perceptron algorithm to make order of n mistakes. If that is the mistake bound, prove by construction that you can actually hit the mistake bound. And you can pick a small dimensionality, pick n is 3 and k is 1 if you want, just to see if you can uh, invent, basically push the algorithm to be bad, to the bad uh, regime. So. All of this is in the case when the data is separate. Of wire cast. 
when the data is separable, it's pretty neat. It makes no mistakes about, it makes no assumptions about the data. The sequence of examples could be adversarial, it doesn't care. After making R square over gamma square mistakes, you know you've learned if you knew gamma. Right? And it's not a function of the total size of data. You could have the entire internet, every document on the internet labeled as positive or negative, but if the concept is linearly separable, you don't care. After making a finite number of mistakes, you don't even care about seeing the next example because you know you have uh, learned the concept. Or you know you won't make any more mistakes. Of course, to compute gamma, uh, you don't know when to stop, but you know that it is finite. That's the good news. The bad news is that uh, real life is not linearly separable, uh, but we live in that. We, we have to live in that. And there are variations of uh, you know, for that can handle this. The usual tricks for uh, the case when your data is not linear separ linearly separable is maybe add more features or maybe limit some error. You don't want to add more features, you are you're willing to compromise uh, the complexity of your model for some error. Or you are willing to do this trick of blowing up the feature space or you will end up, or you will talk about kernels very soon, we can use kernels. There are other tricks like uh, averaging and that's something that we'll get to right now. And averaging is something that you absolutely, if you are implementing Perceptron, you should use the averaging trick because you don't know anything about uh, separability or any property of the data. So before getting into the practical aspects of the algorithm, what you need to know from this section is you need to know the mistake count. You need to know how many mistakes will Perceptron make before you need to stop and you should be able to prove it because it's a rather simple proof. It's basically four lines spread across multiple slides. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. So in the five or so minutes that are left, I'm going to talk about some variants of the algorithm. The first one is about all, the, here, typically in real life, you don't have a stream of examples. You have a finite data set. So how do you use perceptron in that setting? The second one is this trick called averaging that I mentioned. And finally, I'll, if there's time, I'll end with uh, something called the margin perceptron. This is a demonstration the of wire The standard test. algorithm, when you have a finite data set, is rather simple. Notice that this bit here is the perceptron algorithm. All you do is just multiple passes over the data. That's it. So you initialize the weight vector to zero and then you have multiple epochs. And in each epoch you pick an example, make an update and whatever. That's all that is. This is the standard implementation. This is the version of Perceptron that you should be implementing. How many passes should you do over the data? In fact, the parameter t, it's an input to the program. It's a hyperparameter. Uh, in practice, typically if you're doing more than 10, or 20, you're doing something wrong. Because you're not going to get any more gains beyond that. That's just an observation. It's, it, there's nothing formal about that statement. An important thing that you have to do, absolutely should do, is before getting into this is a demonstration loop, of wire before test. starting that loop, you, have to, you should shuffle your data. And it makes a big difference in practice. And in fact, you will see how much of a difference it makes in your homework when you try out both the shuffled and the unshuffled versions. And just to remind you, I can write y times w transpose x less than zero as another is another way of writing whether there's an, of checking whether there's an error. The other way is to predict and see if the prediction is equal to the true list. So this is the version of perceptron that you will be implementing. The second uh, practical thing is about is called the voted or average perceptron. So in the standard version of the perceptron, you always return the final weight. So let's pretend the following happens. Say I have a million examples and I go through them one at a time. And I've not made a mistake. Let's say I have a million and one example. I have not made a mistake for a million examples. And then the last one comes in. And then it makes a mistake. 
and it updates. Now, the question to you is which wing vector is better? Is the last one better because it updated after a mistake? Or is the one that survived a million rounds without any problems the better one? Which one would you trust more? The last one? How many people say the last one? How many people say this the million? This is a demonstration mm -hmm. of wire cast. Practical? What do you mean practical? You want to say, I want to make a lesson fake, so you just didn't encounter it, right? So you could have been saying that a whole million times. And then once you make that mistake, you're not going to make the mistake again. Did you update it? You, you, no, you might make the mistake again. It's possible. So remember, we are living in the world of uh, real data, which is not linearly separable. So the last one could be noise. So we don't know. So here's a variant. Here's an, uh, another algorithm. At every step, whether you make a mistake or not, you remember the weight vector. Okay? You remember every weight vector that you uh, that ever crosses paths with an example. And at the end, once the algorithm is done, when you want to make your final prediction, instead of using the last weight vector, you use this whole set and each one of them gets a what. Which means the weight vector that survived a million rounds gets a vote of a million. And the last one, after update, gets a vote of what? It survived one or zero, depending on how you count. So that's called the voted perceptron. And we won't talk about the formal part of it, but the voted perceptron comes with some rather strong theoretical guarantees of future performance. Not of the number of mistakes, but of performance on unseen data. Which is good. But in practice, this is a difficult thing to implement. Because you, if you have a million examples, you end up remembering a million weight factors. Or if you, you can optimize that, but even the optimized versions of those are not particularly easy to implement. So the practical variant of it, which does not come with theoretical guarantees, but is in fact always the algorithm that's used when people say perceptron is the average perceptron. The average perceptron, what it does, instead of using all the weight vectors, you use the average weight vector across the entire training sequence as the final. A demonstration of wire cast. What does that mean in practice? And I'll show you the algorithm and then let you go. You add one extra length. In addition to your weight vector <coughs> W, which is an n-dimensional vector, you keep another vector A, which is also an n-dimensional vector. And at every step, whether or not you make an update, you add W to A. This is basically averaging the weights. And at the end, you return not W, but A. This is a demonstration of And this should have been A. Yes. So your final prediction at the end, so Notice that to check for a mistake, you use W. And the final thing that you return is an A. This is the version of perceptron that is usually seen in papers when people say they have implemented perceptron. And you won't be implementing this for your homeworks, but out there in the real world, if you want to talk about perceptron, you should implement this. And in fact, I'll leave you with this question. If you there are very easy perceptron, very easy programming tricks that you can use to make sure that this update only happens when uh, there is a mistake. And that bit, it requires a little, just a little bit of thinking and uh, some linear algebra. So you don't store an A, but you store a variant and then you compute an A at the end. And the trick is you only update when there's a mistake. So that becomes a mistake driven algorithm again. <laughs> So we'll pick up from this in the next lecture, and I'll be around if there are any questions.